up last night at my home. We had Martha over for some fellowship last evening, and, and we're going to hopefully have her come back and maybe do a extended Bible study with our ladies in the fall. So we'll talk to you about that more. Thank you, Martha. Take your Bibles, if you would, Psalm 113. Psalm 113. When you find your place in the Word of God, if you'll stand in honor of God's Word, we're going to read this short psalm together. Psalm 113. Stand with Bible in hand. Of course, with today being Mother's Day, I want to speak on the subject of fulfilled mothers. A fulfilled mother. Psalm 113. Psalm 113. I want to read the entire psalm. You follow along with me as I read aloud. Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun and the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and His glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God, and uh, who dwelleth on high? Who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill. That he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. Now our text verse, verse 9. He maketh the barren woman to keep house, and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise you, Lord. God, we do want to praise you with all our lives, our souls, our mouths. We pray, dear God, that you would bless this message this morning in considering this tremendous institution of motherhood that you created. God, I pray for the fulfillment, the content, the completeness of every mother in this place. All the mothers associated with our church for motherhood around the world, God. Bless our time together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. Thank you. Now the word fulfilled is a very important word. Fulfilled mother. That's what I want to say about today. The word fulfilled is kind of like one of those double emphasis words. You break it apart, we think about the word full and the word filled. <laughs> they both basically mean the same thing. The idea is of overflowing. The idea is of being totally consumed with something. So to be fulfilled in anything it means to be overflowed with it, to be so contented and complete in that thing. And God wants every mother to be a fulfilled mother. You know, the world mocks and ridicules the idea that women can be fulfilled, can be contented today in our day and age by living what we would call a traditional stay-at-home uh, job as a mother, as a wife, right? I call it the biblical pattern. Better than traditional wives and mothers, that's the biblical pattern. But I'll tell you who isn't uh, mock, doesn't mock and condemn mothers who do that. God doesn't. That's His plan. It was His idea to begin with. Motherhood is one of the greatest and highest callings that God has ever placed on anyone's life, man or woman. As long as women in our society today think of children as, as a burden, as baggage, instead of the blessing that God intends her to be, that woman, that mother will never find fulfillment. You know, fulfillment can never really be found anyway. If selfish people are seeking fulfillment, they'll never find it because God has to give it as a gift. Notice in our text in verse 9, it says, He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Just like it's a miracle that God would, would make a barren woman a mother, He also has to make her a joyful mother. No wonder the response to such fulfillment is the end of that verse. It says, Praise ye the Lord. I tell you, any woman who's blessed with not only having a child, but having the wonderful and joyous responsibility of raising that child, ought to respond with those words, praise ye the Lord. You know, if God's uh, the one that makes a woman fulfilled as a mother, we might ask the question, does that mother have any part in finding that joy and that fulfillment? Well, of course she does. God doesn't indiscriminately just give fulfillment and contentment to some people, not give it to others. He doesn't do anything indiscriminately, just like He doesn't save to certain people. He saves those who repent, turn to the Lord, and trust Him. He wants all people to be saved. And He wants all mothers.
others to find this joy, this fulfillment that he speaks about. But in order for a woman to do that, there's some things she has to do. So one of the messages today is to explain how you mothers, and all mothers for that matter, can find real fulfillment. To be overflowed, overjoyed with all that God wants you to be. Now let me start with the first thing. You must have in your life, ladies, to be a fulfilled mother. A fulfilled mother is first a saved woman. A saved woman. You know, there can be no real joy, no real peace, no, no position, nothing in life, no circumstance in life can really make a difference if a person's not saved. I mean, life's burdens and struggles and uncertainties are enough for any one person to face, let alone a woman who has the responsibility of far more than their children's lives to take care of and to be responsible for. If a woman has found no peace in her heart, she doesn't know who God is. She doesn't know who she really is. She doesn't really know what life's about. How in the world is she going to be able to deal with the demands of children and of a husband, of, of working and taking care of the home and all the struggles of society? It's impossible. You know, I can hardly, uh, or hardly, I should say, I can hardly understand why uh, our society has gotten to the point where we're having this rash of, of horrifying uh, child killings, mostly by our and some fathers involved, but mostly my mother. You know what it is? They think about these women. They have no hope. They, they cannot escape the pain and suffering of their own individual lives. And so they think that if they get rid of their kids, then they can concentrate on themselves and try to work out whatever their problems are that are plaguing them. Of course, it doesn't work. And of course, we think of the, the terrible tragedy of abortion. It's the same idea. So many women just think, well, if I can get rid of that child, if that child wasn't in my life, then I can concentrate on myself and, and work out my own problems. All oh, friends, without Christ, without the new life He gives, without the completeness that only He offers, our selfish, innate sinfulness is always going to want to put ourselves first no matter who gets in the way. They only knew the fulfillment they could have in Jesus Christ. Others, others to be in this room. With Christ, there is hope. With Christ, there is joy. With Christ, there is wisdom. With Christ, you can be the fulfilled and completed and joyful mother God wants you to be. You don't have to live in the struggles and the trials and, and, and the disappointments, the, the depressions of our life, of our society of lives today all around us. So, first of all, a fulfilled mother has to be a saved. Number two, I would say this. A fulfilled mother is a surrendered Christian. Is a surrendered Christian. You know, being saved puts us in a right relationship with God as His children. But, enjoying the Christian life is determined by what degree we follow the Lord and enjoy the benefits of being a follower of Christ. You know, my children... Uh, are in a relationship by birth with myself and their mother, but the enjoyment of that relationship is dependent on how we treat one another, how we live towards each other, right? And so a saved mother still has to go farther and be a surrendered Christian, a mother that lives for the Lord. And she'll find that fulfillment that every mother seeks in three areas as a surrendered Christian. First of all, she needs to be doing this. She needs to be searching for God in the Scriptures. Searching for God in the Scriptures. You know, like, you know one thing I love about Martha? We talked about this last night. She, she's a lover of the Word of God. She spends time in God's book every day. Ladies, we've said this so many times. I know how busy life is. We're all busy. We all have the same 24 hours to live every day. You've got to prioritize your time to search the Scriptures, to read the Bible, to feed your soul. Before you get those little ones up and deal with all the things that will come at you in a day, you've got to search the Scriptures and have your mind washed and cleansed and renewed. A surrendered Christian woman searches the Scriptures every day. Number two, she seeks God in prayer every day. Every day she's seeking God. Remember Hannah? Hannah needing, needing a child, wanting a child so desperately that situation she was in with another wife out there why it was and every every day she would pray and God finally gave her Samuel. Blessed her life. I'll tell you, being persistent in prayer. 
What a blessing that is. Pray for your children. Pray for your husband. Pray for your church. Pray for your pastor. Pray for our country. There's so many needs, ladies. And you have to be seeking God in prayer. I remember Mrs. Barber, Helen Barber, Dr. Barber's wife, my English teacher, and back in college, back in May. <coughs> Excuse me. And I remember her saying she prayed for 35 years for her mother. Uh, no, her father did he say? He finally went. 35 years of prayer for her father. I'll tell you what, ladies, you have to be committed to seeking God in prayer, searching the scriptures. And then I have to say, thirdly, this is what will make a surrendered Christian mother fulfilled serving God in the church. Serving God in the church. You know, I think of the women like like Dorcas kind of the, the book of Acts. I think of Barnabas. Barnabas had a sister that opened her house to the early church. It was there. They went and prayed for Peter when he had been arrested and was going to be beheaded. Remember God let him out of that jail? He went to the home and wrote an answer to the door. That was at Barnabas' sister's home. She opened her whole house to the church. I tell you, when serving the Lord, ladies, that's where you're going to find your fulfillment. That's where God's going to bless you and use you. And I tell you, if it wasn't for faithful women in this church, I don't know where we'd be. We know there's certain offices, and women don't have every office, and men don't have every office either. Find your place of service. Serve God and the church mothers. You'll find such reward. I was sitting across from a couple up north, and I was pastoring in Columbus. They were having some problems, and there were some issues going on in the church. Now, I remember the lady saying her husband was kind of more uh, wanting to uh, just throw him the towel, leave the church, and the whole thing. And she looked over at him and me, and she said, you know what? I can't leave this church. I find my fulfillment and my purpose for living my Christian life here. And she settled for him. She settled for him. Ladies, if you want fulfillment, you've got to first be a saved woman. You've got to be number two, a surrendered Christian. But number three, a fulfilled mother is a submissive wife. A submissive wife. Ladies, let me just begin by saying you can never be a better mother than you are a wife. I know, and I'm going to say this as a somewhat of a disclaimer. I know there are women, and even in our church we have some, who are raising their children alone because either of divorce or they didn't marry the father of their children or maybe they had, uh, he could even have in the home a father that doesn't help them raise the kids. And, and none of those are the ideal scenario, and none of those are God's plan. But we deal with those, and we have grace and mercy on such ladies. But I've got to give you the, the norm. I've got to give you the rule. Those are the exception, right? A fulfilled mother is going to be a submissive wife. Good mothers always start as good wives. It has to be in that order. Would to God we can teach women in our culture even to become wives before they become mothers. You know what I'm getting at by that. God has an order. A plan for marriage, for childbearing, and for parenting. And when any woman deviates... From that plan and that order, they rob themselves of the ability of having the blessing and fulfillment of motherhood that God wants them to have. In God's eyes, marriage always comes first. It was Adam and Eve first, not Eve and her children. It has to start with the marriage. When husband and wife are in the right relationship in their marriage, they are then ready for children, not before them. Not before you. Good marriages, of course, always involve husband and wife knowing their roles in the home. This is not a marriage message. I'm not going to get into those roles. The Bible is very clear. The husband is to be the head of his home. The wife is to follow and support and encourage him in his leadership. Others, if you want to be fulfilled, you've got to be a good wife first. You'll never be a good mother without that. A wife that understands her role in the marriage will make a great mother because she'll be beginning on the right foot. Being wrong in marriage makes it impossible to be right in marriage. Impossible. Now thankfully God is merciful and, and God is so gracious and He forgives and He restores and He brings broken marriages back together and restores pairing relationships that have been messed up in the past. Aren't you glad the Bible says He gives the grace of the humble? Enable them help, divine help. He'll do that. But any girl, any any woman who's married or, or will be married, to be a good mother. Let me state several things about marriage have to come first. 
you're going to be a fulfilled mother, you have to be the right kind of wife. It starts, number one, with marry the right man. Are you ladies and have not married yet? Marry the right man. I speak to our teams once a month or so on the first Wednesday of the month. I was there meeting over the next door, and I, I've spoken on this several times with them. I tell these teenage girls, you, you better not walk for souls just because he's interested in you, just because he's got a nice car or a truck or whatever. It better be a whole lot more than that. Marry the right man. Marriage is for life. I'm shocked when I hear these people say, well, I didn't know so-and-so. After they've been married a few years, they were thrown to die. Why didn't you know so-and-so? That's the most important decision you can make in life outside of salvation. So you're going to marry. Marry the right man, girls. And then be the right wife. Be the right wife. How do you be the right wife? First of all, support your husband. You ought to be your husband's greatest cheerleader. That's what men need. Somebody said men are 90 percent ego, and that's probably an understatement. <laughs> that's true. Uh, men need support. They need encouragement. That's why you have girls cheerleaders on the side of the ball game. You don't have boys cheering for girls, you have girls cheering for boys. God made it that way. Support your husband. Do serve your husband. Now, I have to say, ladies, girls, you back to those who haven't been married yet, or contemplating marriage later. If you plan on marriage to be served, don't get married. You get married to serve. Serve your husband. Now, uh, those Father's Day is coming up in a couple weeks. I'll get to that. Don't worry. Yeah, this, this is the one side of the equation for it. Not only support your husband, serve your husband. Serve his needs and then satisfy your husband. God created the wife to the only person on earth that is satisfied the physical needs of her husband. Don't fail in that area. So a fulfilled mother is not only a, a saved woman, a surrendered Christian, but she's a submissive wife. Fourthly and lastly, a fulfilled mother is a special caregiver. A fulfilled mother is a special caregiver. I'll tell you, and I've only been able to observe this from a distance with my own wife, a tremendous mother to our kids. I'm so grateful for her, what she did in bringing up our kids, and actually a great grandmother. Uh, not a great grandmother, she's a great grandmother figure. Not a great grandmother, not that old yet. But as I look from a distance, I think about the, the tender, warm, soft, affectionate relationship that a mother has with her children. There's really nothing like it. Hey, I love being a dad. I love being a, being a papa now. But there's nothing like seeing a woman with her child. That relationship is different. There's, there's no other human bond of affection that quite is like it. Mothers, if you want to be fulfilled as a mother, you've got to put all in the take care of your children. It's got to be kind of a, a, a thing. It's not just a secondary thought. This might sound generic, but what does it mean for a woman to be a special caregiver? That uh, really mothers are. The very word mothering comes from the same idea of nursing and, and to be a nurturer. It's a caregiver. It's that motherly instinct we talk about. It's from God. First of all, to be a special caregiver, love comes from Love has to come for his first liberty. In Titus chapter 2, Titus is being written to by Paul, and here's what Titus is told. He better tell the women in his church. Verse 3, it says, The age women likewise, that they may be in behaviors, become of holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, that means to be alert, serious about their past. To love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You know, we know love is more than just an emotion. It's not just uh, some words. It's a choice. Love is a choice we make to put someone before ourselves. I tell you, if there's anything that is sacrificial, it has to be a life of a mother. What a sacrifice she makes. Every day, it's not about her. It's not about her schedule. It's not about what she's going to do, what she wants to do. 
It's about her husband and her children. And since her husband may be gone more, and she may be with those kids more, which is God's plan. God made it that way. Then her focus has to be on those children. What love she has to have for them. You know, I think about the loving part of the mother. Uh, you know, with a mother, you know the old statement the Bible teaches, love covers a multitude of sins, love is blind. I think that's really true for our mothers. You know, their children could be rascals and the mother will still say something good. But thank God for that. We all need that. Hey, but for our mothers saying good things about us, uh, who would? I love all those sports shows and the sport that again, the ball game, you see the guy waving to his mom. He never says, hi, dad. He says, hi, mom. That's who they love the most. Mom was always there for them. Think about this man. I was reading a story about a man named Henry Way. Henry Way uh, was given a rather large inheritance from his own mother. His dad died. Henry Way went to the uh, horse races in Kentucky Derby and waged nearly all of them on a walk on a race that he lost. And in fact, they, some other family members took him to court over as, as a, a form of grand larceny. The only one that was going to be able to determine his fate was his own mother. So his 71-year-old mother came up to the stand, Miss Lillian Way, she was 71 years old, the widow, of course. And when the prosecutor got her up on the stand, he was hoping that she'd seal the deal to convict Henry Way for his grand larceny, basically embezzling the family's money, wasting it all in the horse racks. You know what she said? She said, I haven't long to live. I hope God will forgive my sins, and I want to forgive my sins. I thought that's just a mother for you. You think you're getting a mother that that's what I get to decide that I'm going to happen. Look at that. That's what love is. Love is passionate. But not only must love come first, but time comes next. Time comes next. I mean, time is how we spell love. Not L-O-V-E, but T-I-M-E. That's what love really is. Time. We read our text and it talks about her being a, a, a joyful mother of children, keeping the house. God equates joy, the joy of motherhood, with, with housekeeping and, and, and keeping a house. She's a joyful mother of children. Now, that joy doesn't come uh, just in spending time cleaning the floors and cooking the meals and cleaning the clothes. That time with your children, moms, I love that video. It shows so many of those things in the video. How you know how mothers really know all the time she spends with her kids. I gotta say, if it wasn't for my dear wife, I, I didn't spend nearly as much time. I love my kids, all three of them, and I try to spend time with them. But I didn't spend as much as my dear wife did with them. They know where to go when they wanted a book read to them. They know they, they knew where to go uh, when they wanted something from the store. That was too tight. <laughs> They, they knew what, where to go to get something they wanted. Mom would give it to them. But moms spend time playing with your kids, reading to your kids, watching them, sitting down and discussing things, being a counselor and a listener. I think, Mom, that's, that's time spent. That's what it means to be a caregiver. You love first, you spend time next. But thirdly, I might add to this, you might also, must also be training your children. You've got to be trained. Love. You spend time with your children. Now, training children really involves three areas. First of all, teaching them. Now, we teach more by what we do than what we say. You know this. We better uh, be setting the right example. But when you think about teaching a child, you know, there's three parts to all of us. We're, we're triune in a sense, just like God. And we're not eternal like God, but we have a triune nature, body, soul, and spirit. The physical, the social, and the spiritual. And a good mother is going to look at her kids and look at all three of those areas. How's my child doing in their physical development? You know, it's mom to put the band-aids on. It's mom to give the medicine, right? It's mom to do those things. It's mom to make sure they're fed right and not eating junk all the time. Their teeth are about to fall out. It's mom to do that. Physically. Well, how about socially? Yeah, it's usually mom to teach their kids social skills. Now, dad, you need to step in. Part of that. Mom's going to be with them on. Mom's going to make them say yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir, thanks, please, manners, things like that. Moms are the ones that they give that softer side to their kids. So the kids are, are animals. 
I'm telling you, we all be like that. One for our moms, moms bring up their kids. And then spiritually, wow, when I think of the spiritual part that my wife has had in our kids' life, it's been unbelievable. I tell you, moms, let me say this, your greatest mission to be able to teach your kids. That's your mission to Hey, if you send uh, money to missionaries all over the world and you reach out to people in your neighborhood and you reach people in, in your neighborhood and on the work or on the job, if you work a job, that's all great. I, I hope you do that. But if your kids die lost without Christ, what did you gain? Nothing. It's like you gained the world, lost your own soul. That's your children and your soul, maybe your, your very heart. Oh, I'll tell you. Think about the fact that. Mothers, they teach their kids about spiritual things. You have to remember, too, you have to discipline. I'm only teaching them and disciplining them. Now, I do believe a father is the primary disciplinarian. It says fathers provoke not your children to wrath. So God had in his mind that a man would be the primary disciplinarian. And that's how it should be. But let's face it, by the, by the sake of time that a mother has with her kids more than the father, she's going to have to do some disciplining. And you know one of the greatest things she can do is not get in the way of the father trying to discipline his kids like he should. Ladies, don't ever be guilty of this. I've sat across from couples in my office as a pastor and had, and had a man tell me that his wife will not let him spank their kids when they need to spank. I thought, what in the world's happening here? The Bible does keep spanking, by the way. Read the book of Proverbs and underline your circle, get in your, your cords and your phone, and you look up the word raw and send it down to the Jews in the problem. It teaches that. Now teach abuse. Don't let the world fill your head with that lie. We don't believe in abuse. We believe in proper discipline. It doesn't involve spank. You have got to break a child's will. But ladies, you have to have some control over your kids, especially if you have them for eight or ten hours a day when your husband's not there and the father's not there. You better have some control. It can't be a total madhouse and free for all while thought the dad's gone. So you teach them, you discipline, you have to have standards. You have to have some kind of boundaries. Develop those in your kids. And of course, those without saying, I mentioned this, you, you have to set the example. You have to set the example. One guy, one preacher said on Mother's Day, my mother preaches, or, or my mother practices what I preach. <laughs> I like that. That's right, he got it for her anyway. That's true. Remember what it said about a, a widow indeed in the, in the book of 1 Timothy 5? And it said, you know, the only women that were able to be supported by the church financially, she was a widow, was to be one who set a good example. It talks about her being a faithful mother, too. Take care of the church, helping the saints, yes, but being a faithful mother. She's got to be one that has that kind of testimony, setting the right example. Well, more could be said. I'll bring it to a close by saying this. Did you notice that? Everything that I just looked at with you about the characteristics of a fulfilled woman, they have one thing in common. They all put someone else before the mother of the It's God first, it's husband first, it's children first. Thus, we're back to the conclusion of this circle I started with. According to God's plan, the key to finding fulfillment, not only for mom, but all of us, any person, the key is is not to seek it ourselves. Simply put others first and God will give it to you. People who seek happiness, they never find it. That's what our world is, is throwing at us all the time through advertisement and media. That if you'll just seek to be happy through having this or doing that, this or becoming that, then you'll find some fulfillment. You'll really get a fine joy in your life. Find some kind of happiness. It'll never happen. Read the book of Ecclesiastes for Solomon writes and all the things he did to try to find something under the sun. And it never did happen. I'll tell you, if you want to find fulfillment, mothers, women, you've got to put God, put your husband, put your children. Is that easy to do? No. It's impossible to do. Huh? That's the grace of God. That's why you've got to be a saved woman. You've got to be a surrendered Christian. You gotta be a submissive wife, right? You gotta be a special character. You can only be those things through God and God. It's one of the great principles. In all the word of God, Jesus said, He that saves his life shall lose it. But he that loses his life for my sake and the gospel, the same shall save it. That's what he was saying. I get in the 
message by an illustration of, to me, the most fulfilled of all mothers we can mention. Mary, the mother of Jesus. You know, she wasn't perfect. She was not sinless by any means. But I believe, though we don't have the record of it, I, I'm just going to speculate that Mary died a contented woman. And his wife, a contented woman. Twice, Luke, the writer, records that Mary hears things and sees things and ponders them in her heart. When Jesus was that little boy at 12 years old. They went and found him back at the temple. The Bible says that he went down, Jesus, with them. That's Mary and Joseph. And they came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. Both his dad, foster father Joseph, and mother, Mary's mother. But then it says of her, but his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Do you know why, Mary? I think that's such a full and feeling fulfilled, there it is, fulfilled life. Ladies, she knew Christ was. She knew what her calling was. She knew what her purpose was. And she stayed focused on what she was supposed to. I'm always touched by the last mention of Mary in Scripture. You know what it is. It's in the first chapter of Acts. You know where it has her just taking her place. Not prominent. Not, not the one that's calling the shots. She's not some queen of heaven to be prayed to with rosaries and all that kind of nonsense. No. Last time we see Mary ever mentioned in the Bible, she's taking her place at the first prayer meeting in Acts 1. Having known and seen her resurrected son go back to heaven, and she took her place in the church and found a fulfilled mother. That's what God wants you to be. Ladies, if you're not finding fulfillment as a mother right now, it's not because God doesn't want you to be fulfilled, but it's not God's fault. You've got to put it in the practice. You've got to make these things happen by putting God first. Put your husband and if you don't seek fulfillment and contentment, God will bring it to you. That's great. It's about eyes and closed. We're going to have an invitational time like we always do. Just give you an opportunity in time the word of God is preached. Respond to it however God speaks. You don't push, you don't cross.